Welcome. I am Carolyn Ward Bamford, and on behalf of the Music Division, welcome to this evening's pre-concert talk and concert. Tonight is all about the quintet. On the program tonight for the concert, you're going to hear three quintets, so the traditional uh, quartet of stringed instruments plus an added viola. And that added viola is the topic of tonight's pre-concert talk, which was part of a quintet itself. Um, and um, without giving any more of the story away, I'd like to welcome Alex to the stage. Um, I, Alex is um, self-described as an art historian, an author, and an enthusiastic cosmopolitan. But she has also written tour guides and crime novels. So I think she has uncovered many, many wonderful things that you will learn about soon. So, Veni Vidi Medici. I need to set the clock so I will not talk too much. You know how Italians are. If we start talking, then... So, good evening, and thank you very much for being here today with me in this special day. I would like to thank the Library of Congress in the person of <laughs> Caroline Ward Bamford and David Plyler for inviting me here. It's a great honor for me to be here today with you in this temple of knowledge, especially today, because today is December the 18th, and Antonio Stradivari died in Cremona, in the north of Italy, on December the 18th, 1737. So I find it somehow fascinating and touching that we are here together 281 years later to talk about this legendary violin maker and his instruments. So we will embark on a journey through the past of a very special set of instruments made by Stradivari. But before doing that, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, just a little bit. So as you've heard, I'm an art historian and an expert on the history of the instruments made by Antonio Stradivari and his sons. So I research the past of these instruments. What does that mean? So I do primarily two things. I research the past of the instruments, looking for new unpublished information, and I try to correct historical mistakes when I find them. Stradivari was already quite famous during his lifetime, so people began to write about him quite early. And through the centuries, historical mistakes were made and then passed on from a biographer to another. So let's put it this way. Copy and paste was definitely not invented by our generation. So, so when I find these mistakes, I try to amend them. So of course, every new information is for me like a piece of a puzzle that will eventually give me the chance to see a full picture. And what I do, I mean, researching the past of the instruments is also, of course, researching the past of the people. So the owners and the players. So it's a kind of investigation. So much so that some of my colleagues have nicknamed me, do not laugh, Sherlock, <laughs> and I'm very proud of my nickname. <laughs> but now enough about me, let's turn to the quintet. Here you are, the quintet as we know it today. I've written down 
um, under each, um, every image you see when it was done, when it was made by Stradivari, um, which instrument it is. So we're talking about five instruments, two violins, two violas, and a cello, of course. And then I wrote down the names of the instruments. Um, the instruments, through their 300 odd years history, um, have changed their names. Sometimes they've been called Medici, sometimes they've been called uh, Medici, Tuscan. A couple of them have been called Tuscan, then some Tuscan Medici. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I wrote down Medici Tuscan this evening because usually when we have more, an instrument that's, uh, that has more than one name, we follow a chronological order. So Medici Tuscan would do. Starting from your left-hand side, you see that the first four instruments are dated 1690. And the violin on your right-hand side is dated 1716. So for an historian, it's already getting interesting, I would say. When I started researching this quintet, I asked myself three questions. A, who commissioned <coughs> sorry, Stradivari with the quintet? B, were they intended to be a quintet at the beginning, or some additional instruments had been lost through the centuries? And C, as you've seen already, why was one of the instruments delivered more than 20 years after the others? So we said, that this is the Medici Quintet, so it must have had something to do at some point or another with the Medici family. But who were the Medicis? The Medici, the Medici family ruled Florence for almost 300 years, from the Middle Ages to the 18th century. Originally, it was not a noble family, but through the centuries, they managed to get seven grand dukes, four lords, and what's very important, two popes. And believe me, at the time, you must have had very much power and connections to get a pope elected within your family. So the Medici made Florence into one of the wealthiest cities in Europe. And to give you a feeling of who the Medici were and why this quintet was so important for Stradivari for the beginning of his career, I would like to introduce you to three very important members of the Medici family. We will start from the very beginning with Giovanni de Bici de Medici. Giovanni laid the foundation for the wealth of the Medici family. And I'm sure as soon as you will see his image, you will recognize him immediately. Does he look familiar? <laughs> of course, it's a joke. This is, this is Mr. Dustin Hoffman playing the role of Giovanni de' Medici on a TV series dedicated to the Medici. So now on your right-hand side, you see a portrait of Giovanni de' Medici. But I must say, well, they quite look alike because <laughs> there is some similarity. So, Giovanni's father was a wool merchant, and through his life, he accumulated a large patrimony. On his death, 
everything that he had was divided into five equal parts. Each one of his sons got one fifth. Giovanni was one of the five sons. But Giovanni was a really clever one. So he soon realized that this fifth would not be enough. So he decided he, he needed to get a job. He went to work with his uncle, Vieri de' Medici. His uncle was a money lender. Giovanni was extremely good at that. Within a couple of years, he took over the branch in Rome of the bank of his uncle, and then he founded his own bank, the Banco Medici. This is very important. The Medici Bank, everything begins there with the Medici Bank. So it was a Banco Medici, but do you know why we call a bank in that way? Why is a bank a bank? In Italy, in Italy at the time, money lenders used to do their business to show their money on wooden tables. A wooden table was called in Italian a banco. So from the Italian banco, we get a bank. And what's even more interesting, in my opinion, is that when a money lender went broke, the city authority came and literally broke his banco, his table, to show to everyone that that money lender went broke. And by doing so, this table, this banco, was rotto. From a banco rotto in Italian, we have bankrupt in English. Interesting, isn't it? I find it fascinating. But back to Giovanni. Giovanni was of the opinion that the tax system in Florence, in his city, was unjust. He was right, it was pure chaos, it was a mess. Because at the time, the citizens were taxed on consumption. And that affected equally rich and poor. So Giovanni was among a group of people who wanted to change this system and have the people taxed on income and property of individual families. For us nowadays, it's quite normal. You get taxed according to what you earn. But at the time, it was quite revolutionary. Eventually, the system was changed. And of course, he gained the respect of the majority of the citizens of Florence. This is a second very important point, because the Medici's always paid very much attention to have the people of Florence on their side. Giovanni loved his city very much, and he sponsored some public buildings. For instance, he paid to have this church renewed. It's a basilica, the Basilica of St. Lawrence, in the quarter where he used to live. This church will become the official church of the Medici family. Um, in Italy at the time, and until the 18th century, every important family had a church because the supporters of that family would only go to that church. That's the reason why we have so many churches in Italy. It's, it's one of the reasons. It's so Giovanni started sponsoring building to improve his city. His son Cosimo 
brought his ideas further. Cosimo was a very skillful diplomat. He opened branches of the Medici Bank in London, in Paris, in Bruges, and in all the major European cities. He loved the arts and he sponsored several buildings, public as well as religious buildings, and he supported artists. Cosimo was the first one to open his private, his personal library to the public. He gave public access to his library. And that led to the foundation of the Medici Library, which was then built by Michelangelo. You see it on your left-hand side. On your right-hand side, you have an example of a work that was commissioned um, by Cosimo. It's a work by Donatello. And Donatello was, at the time, probably the most important sculpture in Italy. So, of course, patronage was a weapon in Cosimo's hands, but it did work. On the day he died, Cosimo was proclaimed by the citizens of Florence, Pater Patrie, Lord of the Country. His successors learned from him, especially his nephew, Lorenzo. This is a fresco that was commissioned by Cosimo. I call it a propaganda fresco. Um, so we're talking about Cosimo. Cosimo paid for the fresco. So we would consider, okay, he got the, the, the biggest part. He's probably a guy in the center on the horse. No. Cosimo is here. Wait, I need to move. He is the small guy with the blue tunica riding a brown donkey. We're talking about the most powerful man in Florence, which means one of the most powerful people in Europe. Extremely modest, very simple, riding a donkey. Why? Because this is a propaganda fresco. So on his left hand side, you see his son, Piero, on a white horse. That's already an improvement. I mean, Piero got a horse. But in the center of the fresco, there is the future of the Medici family. Here. This is the guy riding a white horse, wearing a golden tunica, holding a crown on his head, is Cosimo's nephew, Lorenzo, the future Lorenzo the Magnificent. In this guy, in his hands, lay the future of the family, and he was portrayed as Caspar, the youngest Magus. But Lorenzo was definitely not a handsome man. As you can see here, I mean, Brad Pitt look different, looks different. Um, by the way, this is a fantastic bust that you have here in Washington at the National Gallery. It's either by Verrocchio or a copy from a Verrocchio, and Verrocchio was Leonardo's teacher. So if you still haven't seen it, it's definitely having, um, worth having a look at. So why was Lorenzo already, during his lifetime, called the Magnificent by the citizens of Florence? Amazing. He was a skillful diplomat, a great politician, 
and an extremely generous patron of the arts. He supported artists like Botticelli and Michelangelo. Lorenzo founded the first Academy of Art. He was really the first one who recognized the genius of Michelangelo. He had Michelangelo, the young Michelangelo, stay at his place, live with his family among his children because he had recognized his talent. Again, of course, Lorenzo's activity were an effort at earning collective support. But thanks to him and to other members of the Medici family, we can enjoy today incredible masterpieces because his example was followed by the members of the family who came after him. For instance, his cousin, who was also called Lorenzo, commissioned Botticelli with the spring, the primavera, and the bird of Venus. So now that we have explained why Lorenzo was the magnificent, we would tend to consider that probably Lorenzo commissioned Stradivari with our quintet. Unfortunately, Lorenzo lived 200 years before Stradivari. So who commissioned Stradivari with the work? Let's see who ruled Tuscany during Stradivari's time. This guy was the ruler, Cosimo III de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany for 53 years. His is the longest reign in Tuscan history. So, is he a good candidate for our quintet? I would say so, yes. He wasn't particularly fond of music, but he supported sporadically church music. So, two very important and distinguished Stradivari experts were of the opinion that this guy, Cosimo III, commissioned Stradivari with the work. The Hill Brothers of London and Ernest Doring in America. But, an Italian musicologist, the Piccolellis, said, no, it was Cosimo's eldest son, Ferdinando, Grand Prince Ferdinando de' Medici, who was a customer of Stradivari. Who was Ferdinando? Grand Prince Ferdinando was a music lover. He played several instruments. He employed the best singers and players of his time at his court. And what's most important for us, he commissioned several compositions as well as music instruments. So was Ferdinando a good candidate for our quintet? I would say definitely. Now we have two different points of view. We have on one side the Hill brothers and Ernest Doring who said it was Cosimo III, the Grand Duke, who commissioned Stradivari with the quintet. On the other side, we have the Piccolellis the musicologist who said it was Ferdinando, was his son, who was right. You want to take a bet? <laughs> they were all wrong. <laughs> I know. 
it was a Marquise. It was the Marquise Ariberti, who was a devoted admirer of Stradivari, who commissioned Stradivari with three, not five, three instruments, a cello and two violins, because he wanted to present them to Ferdinando de' Medici as a gift. How do we know that? Because we found a copy of a letter from the Marquise to Stradivari, in which the Marquise explains to Antonio Stradivari how grateful the Grand Prince Ferdinando was of the gift of the present he received. The letter is in Italian, of course, but I'll read to you the most important passages if I find yes my yeah yeah The other day I made a present of the two violins and the cello which you made for me to his highness the prince of Tuscany and I assure you to my great satisfaction, he has accepted them with such a pleasure that more I could not expect. The members of his orchestra were unanimous in expressing their great appreciation, declaring the instruments quite perfect. And above all, exclaiming with one voice that they have never heard a cello with such an agreeable tone. But now we come to the part that interests us. I have now to request you to begin at once two violas, one tenor and the other contralto which I wanted to complete the concerto. So the commission of the quintet appears, therefore, to have been begun by Marquise Ariberti and continued by Ferdinando de Medici. But if we have a look at the quintet, as we said at the beginning, starting from your left-hand side, yes, the first four instruments are, date, are dated 1690, but the violin on your right-hand side is dated 1716. So today, it is generally agreed that probably Stradivari was asked to replace a violin which had been damaged. At the time, these instruments were not as highly regarded as, now, as we do on nowadays. So if an instrument was badly damaged, they would have thrown it away. What is still not agreed upon is who commissioned Stradivari with this additional violin. It was most probably Gian Gastone de' Medici. He was the last Grand Duke belonging to the Medici family. He was a renowned music lover, so he was probably the one who asked Stradivari uh, to get him an additional violin. But where are these instruments today? Three are still in Florence. They remain there at the Galleria dell'Accademia. So a viola tenor and a cello dated 1690 and the violin, the later violin dated 1716.
the violin that survived from the group dated 1690 is in Rome. It was bought in 1953 uh, from the Italian state. It was sold by the Hill brothers to Italy in 1953. And now we come to the best part of the evening. The contralto viola is here in Washington on loan to the Library of Congress thanks to the Tuscan Corporation. But would you like to know why two instruments left Florence? It's a sad story. I said Gian Gastone was the last grand duke belonging to the Medici family because he died without children. So his next of kin, his only survivor member of the family, was a sister, a woman. She could not inherit the title of Grand Duke. But he left everything what had belonged to him, that means everything what had belonged to the Medici family, to her. <coughs> Anna Maria Luisa de Medici inherited everything, but not the title. She didn't have children herself, and also, if she had had, she could not have passed her surname onto her children, being a woman. So, the title of Grand Duke of Tuscany went to Francis of Lorraine. But Anna Maria Luisa, being a woman, was a very clever person. <laughs> she wrote a contract. And in this contract, she said, I'm going to leave everything what belongs to me, and that means everything what has belonged to the Medici family, to the new Grand Duke of Tuscany on one condition. Everything has to remain in Florence. Nothing can leave the city. Francis of Lorraine thought, well, a gift is a gift. He agreed with that. He signed the contract. But of course, as soon as the Medicis weren't there anymore, things left the country, left the city and left the countries. It's normal. At the time, exactly like we do today, instruments were given on loan to musicians. And there was no one there anymore to check which instrument was where and when it was due back. So at some point, the two instruments left and didn't come back. Our viola left Florence already in 1793. It reached America first time in 1924 when it was bought by Mr. Strauss, whose family owned Macy's, the department store in New York. After several years, the viola was back in Europe and came back to America a second time, in 1957. This time it was bought by Cameron Baird, chairman of the music department at the University of New York, at the State University of New York in Buffalo. On his death, his widow inherited the viola and eventually transferred it to the Tuscan Corporation. And it's thanks to the Tuscan Corporation that we'll have the chance this evening to listen to this amazing viola. I don't want to bore you to death with technical details, but 
I need to say something about this viola. Um, Stradivari used a mold to make this viola, like for every instrument. And the mold he used for this viola, he's been using it for his entire career. So he has used it for the Tuscan, dated 1690. He has used the same mold for the McDonald's viola, dated 1701. He has used it for the Paganini viola, dated 1731. He has used it for the Gibson viola, dated 1734. This is very important because the Gibson viola made in 1734, three years before Stradivari died, is considered his last viola. So you see how pleased he must have been with this form, with this instrument, because he has used it for his entire career. And this shows you how great this viola is. I hope you have enjoyed this brief journey through the past of the quintet as much as I did. If you have questions, you can ask them, of course, and I'll thank you very much for your kind attention. If you do have a question, if you could just wait for the uh, microphone. I hope I can answer that. No. Thank you so much. Um, how big was his shop that he was able to make four in one year? And how long did each one take to make? And you know, how many craftsmen did he have working for him? Well, experts, experts have tried to figure that out for several years. Let's put it this way. The Hill Brothers. Supposed, that's an estimate. They were out of, of the opinion that Stradivari during his career made roughly a thousand a hundred instruments. We have to consider two things. Stradivari was quite an exception because he was quite old when he died. Of course, at the time, a person of 45 was already extremely old. So Stradivari was surely in his latest 80s when he died. We don't know that for sure because we don't know exactly when he was born, but he was surely either 89, 90, or 93 in this range. So he spent his entire life in Cremona working, basically. But of course, he had helpers. Um, his helpers, German or English? Sometimes I have to, sorry, I have sometimes this, this feeling I'm saying something in German. Now. Um, um, Stradivari had 11 children. Surely at least two of them were helping him. So uh, Francesco and Omo Bono. Probably there was a third one, Giovanni Battista Martino, who unfortunately died pretty young. And probably Bergonzi as an extra helper. But the problem with Stradivari is that we don't have the register. We don't exactly know who was working there with him. And because he was already famous during his lifetime, also if the instruments have a label inside with the name of the violin maker, it happened pretty soon that the people who wanted to earn some money on instruments realized that they could change the label in the instruments. So unfortunately, nowadays, we have a very small amount of instruments made, for instance, by his sons, which cannot be but maybe the label got changed. So it's 
Of course, Stradivari worked during his entire career, but probably during the last years, he did mainly the final details of the work. Um, and he was helped, surely, by at least by his uh, sons. But it's, it's considered around 1,100 instruments. Unfortunately, we do not have a list. And we don't have a list today of how many strads are around the world. It's an estimate. Someone says 500, others says, say 600. It's probably around 500. If you consider more than 300 years history, it's amazing. It's amazing. Because it's such a fragile thing, such a fragile object. But yeah, they, they survived. Oops, sorry. Did, <laughs> did I answer your question? Thank you. You mentioned that the two violas in this quintet are different sizes. Um, could you say something about why one would play uh, musicians and the choosing of the sizes? These were meant to be played together, I assume. That's why they're called a quintet. Yes, for um, the quintet. And the ranges of the two sizes of violas and... You say so the, the tenor of viola is not common at all nowadays, but I've, I'm not a musicologist. I do not know why it's not played anymore and it used to be played at a time. I only know that they are very rare, the tenor, the one, the one in the middle that is in Florence. Um, the, the one that Stradivari has made the most of is the contralto. But I cannot tell you, I'm sorry, uh, from the musical point of view, I'm an historian. I'm not, uh, I, I don't play myself. I don't know. But, you, but he didn't make very many of the tenor size. No. Uh, you know. okay. No, because right. no, I know that different uh, luthiers have made different sets of sizes of instruments. And so I'm, I'm interested that he did add a size to the usual. Well, in I can all only say, for instance, in the case of the cello, in the past, the instruments were bigger because of the strings. So mm. to get a deeper, deeper tone, you needed then um, a longer string to get that. And when the strings were not made of iron, of course, because they were um, a, an animal as a, as a base, um, they needed a bigger instrument Good for point. that. Yes. That but if sense. that is related now with the, mm, the tenor that is a bit, yes, Professor Cass <laughs> says yes, so <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> May I start? To continue on with that, r was any uh, music that you know this, again, this is a musicologist question, but was any music written specifically with that size, uh, the tenor size, viola in mind? I do not know, no. Okay, and that. also were any of the forms ever preserved that he used yes. for the instruments? Yes, yes, oh, that's been. why we know that um, Stradivari used a specific mold for the contralto and kept using it because the mold is still in Cremona in the museum. Actually, it's more than one mold in Cremona. And what's interesting is um, there, is a, there is a handwriting on the mold, and it says, I've done, uh, no, not I've done. That was done for the Grand Prince de Medici. Now, we don't know if that's Stradivari handwriting. Some experts are of the opinion that that's Stradivari who wrote that. Some others mean it was his son or Count Cozio. We don't know. But um, someone has written there when it was done and for whom it was done. Yes, we have also the, draw, the, the drafts. Because you can see it only in the tenor viola. You see how wonderful make um, the tailpiece 
there are these, these uh, you see that the craftsman in, in Stradivari, he um, made an, in Mother Pearl the coat of arms of the Medici on the top and at the bottom you have a small cupid. All the instruments were probably um, inlaid like that and through the century they just got lost. But um, what's um, still there on the viola shows us how wonderful he had worked these instruments. And we have his drawers for that in Cremona. They're still there, yeah. And, and has anybody ever used the moles or can they be used again to make a modern day Stradivarius? Um, modern violin maker, of course, you, nowadays you can um, buy, for instance, uh, a bet. I mean, you can ask a good violin maker to make you a violin using the forms of the beds. What does it mean? It's not that someone can go there and use the mold from Stradivari, but of course they've been measured and, and you can reproduce that. What's, what you will not have anymore is a wooden that is so old, a, a wood that is so old, and this 300 year works of the instrument, that makes a difference. Thank you. What I, if, if I um, can add something to that, what I find interesting, I'm, I read in an article that, because there is always this, this question, modern instruments or old Italian masters, what's better? I find, I find that very interesting. Um, it's been, apparently, it has been tested and it's, it's been proved that um, players who think they're playing a Stradivari are playing better. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I think that the psychological factor plays a very big role in that. But, but I'm not a musicologist, it's just my... <laughs> Are there any, here we go. Um, so was Stradivari and his instruments recognized from the get-go as being exceptionally beautiful in sound, or did it build over time as his instruments either spread or he developed his technique? Stradivari's instruments are, mm, compared to most of the others, still quite exceptional. <coughs> and that's the mystery about Stradivari because we do not know with whom he has been learning. Um, several experts are of the opinion that probably he did something else before becoming a violin maker. Something like a wood carverer, for instance, because if you see a Stradivari, and I'm talking about the purfling or the scroll, they are quite different. There is a perfection in the purfling, especially some instrument of, the, of his golden time, for instance. They are just, they are perfect the way they are done. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with the sound. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that they play better because they look better. I'm just saying he was already extremely famous because his instruments looked better. And thanks to that, so many of his instruments have survived. Because for instance, another great violin maker, Guarneri, Guarneri del Gesù. Hmm? Nowadays, his instruments are as expensive as Stradivari's, even more eventually, because we have um, less of them. Guarneri, let's put it abruptly, um, <laughs> made instruments for the people. So when, well, they got damaged, they were thrown away. Stradivari 
made instruments for kings. So we, they had a better chance to survive through the centuries. And this actually happened. But that doesn't have anything to do with the sound. It's just the way. It had a great hand. It was really, really great. Do any of your literary works, as opposed to your historical works, cover the mysteries that you've researched around the instruments? We were told that you're not only a historian, yeah. but that you also have other literary works. Do they involve any of your research? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I've, I've, I've Books of mine have been published about Stradivari instruments, and I regularly write articles for the Strad magazine or Teresio and so on. Um, but the tourist guides and uh, crime novels <laughs> are about other things. Actually, there is a crime novel that takes place in Cremona. Yeah, there is one. But yeah. In the dossier, I mentioned Stradivari, and the story has to do with Stradivari, but it's a contemporary crime novel, so. <laughs> but, well, I'll consider that eventually. I have a question. In all your research on the Stradivari, and I, I think uh, we were told you also have been researching other, the Amates and Guarneris and the ownership and the names. I'm just curious, how far afield have you had to go searching in archives to find letters like the one from the Marquis? And also, have you done any research here at the Library of Congress? Yes, I've been here. I arrived here on November 26th, and I've been locked up here for three weeks. I still haven't seen the White House. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's true, I I'll go tomorrow. But um, I spent from Monday to Saturday at the Library of Congress, um, Actually, because I'm researching the past of an early American violinist, Leonora Jackson. She was a great violinist. Um, we spoke about the end of the 19th century. And um, at the time, it happened very often with women um, who were musicians. As soon as they got married, they had to give up their career. So I have. Um, a series uh, that's dedicated to historical uh, women performer, and I go and look for these women who gave up or had to give up um, their dream. And Leonora Jackson was something particular. I spent with her the, the last three weeks uh, researching um, her past because she had a strad as well. The Leonora Jackson, yeah, the Leonora Jackson strad, very good strad the golden period. Eventually, next year, who knows, I'll be here telling you about Leonora Jackson, who knows. <laughs> and we should say that she's the uh, source of our McKim Fund uh, that commissions a lot of violin and piano works at the Library of Congress, so yeah. very important to us for other reasons, too. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Um, the, the Medici Quintet and the tenor viola, I understand, all had the Medici inlaid at, uh, Most ivory. Yeah. You said that they're missing, I believe, on three of the five. You're, are you able to look at the work and tell that they were inlaid with the ivory? And has the, the ebony been, been uh, abraded to remove the, the, the recess marks of where the original medallion had been? No, in the case of the, um, how you call it, the pintail? How you call the, the two things of the viola? In, in pel tail pin, tail piece, yeah, tail piece, thank you. Um, in the case of the tail piece, um, it's mother pearl. And we know that that viola and the other viola and the cello um, were inlaid because we have the drawers from Stradivari. So they, they have remained, they are in Cremona. So we, we're sure about that. But of course, through the center is quite an exception that the tenor viola still has the original one. 
uh, if you consider the um, neck, it's, there is hardly an instrument, there are a couple of them, but there is nowadays hardly an instrument that still has an original neck. They were all changed. It's very difficult. Um, what we see of a violin, a violin is like a puzzle. So you can literally chop off the scroll and put it somewhere else. So it's, um, it's a rarity to find instruments that are so well conserved. They're really a treasure. I think we'll need to end it there, but thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>